let's understand impulse train sampling of discrete time signals. And here I'm showing a single impulse in the time domain and in the frequency domain, the magnitude response shows a, an equal amount of all frequencies and zero phase across all frequencies. So now let's look at the impulse train. So this is what's going to be used for sampling. And here we're showing sampling every 10 time indices. In the frequency domain, it turns out this impulse train has a Fourier transform that is also an impulse train in the frequency domain. And this can be quite counterintuitive because previously we saw a single impulse was constant across the frequency domain. If we're adding in other impulses, it's very tempting to think that we would just be adding more constant values across the frequency domain and the frequency domain would still be constant, but it's not. It has this form here. So why is that? Let's work that out by building it up from the start. So here's our single impulse. Let's add that to, to that another impulse. And here we've got this second one here. And clearly we can see it's not constant anymore in the frequency domain in the magnitude. And we've introduced a phase component. Now actually this all makes sense because when you think about time shifting a function, what you are doing is adding a linear phase to that function. So in the frequency domain, you will see this linear phase effect. Every single frequency component needs to shift across in order for the function to shift across. And as the frequency goes up, they need to shift across by more, which is why there is this linear phase. So that makes sense. And let's think about this shape in the magnitude. Well, this also makes sense if we think about the fact that these are two delta functions. You might be familiar with knowing a result that if you have a cos waveform in the time domain, then it only has a single frequency. So in the frequency domain, there will just be two delta functions, one at the positive frequency that corresponds to the cos wave and one at the negative frequency. And we know that duality holds in Fourier transforms. So if we have two delta functions in the time domain, then in the frequency domain, it will be a cos function. And that's what we can see here. Of course, here we're plotting the magnitude. So instead of it going up and down around zero, it comes down as the cos waveform and then goes up again and down up again, according to the cos function magnitude. So this makes sense with two delta functions. What about when we start adding in more? Well, we can see the more that we add, the more that our frequency domain is starting to look like the peaky frequency domain that we saw when we had the full impulse train. And we can see that as we get up near to the end, we're going to be having more and more reduction in between these particular frequencies that correspond to our sampling rate here of 10, uh, 10 per second. Therefore, the 10 frequency, 10 hertz, is going to be prominent and in between almost going to zero. I've just stopped it here without adding the final impulse into our train, just to point out that again, we have this linear phase effect when we are just missing one. When we add the last one in, all of the phases cancel out. So the phase that we had from this first one, if you remember, was a negative slope. And then the phase we had without the last one was a positive one. And I think you can see that they're going to be canceling each other out. And now we should be able to understand that in fact we do get this interesting pulse train in the frequency domain when we have a impulse train in the time domain. Let's add a few more in here and just watch that again. I'm going to add some in halfway between. So we're going by the end of adding all of these in, we will be having a sampling rate which is twice the original one. And as you can see, as I add them in here, the 20 hertz is becoming more prominent and the 10 hertz is being reduced because now our impulse train is happening 20 samples per second. And again, when we've filled them all in, we have back to zero at all frequencies in between zero and 20. Or it all makes sense. Another in intuitive way of thinking about this is these extra ones that I've added now means that we have compressed in the time domain because originally we had them every 10. Now we have them 
every five. So we have compressed in the time domain and therefore we have expanded in the frequency domain. These impulses are now further apart. So hopefully this gives more intuition into the impulse trains and what their functions are in the frequency domain. So now let's use them for sampling, uh, digital sampling. So here we have a, the, the top two curves are the same as we just had for the impulse train and its Fourier transform magnitude. Now I'm showing here a sinusoidal waveform. This is the COS waveform. This one has one cycle over the 100 samples, so one cycle per second, so it has one hertz. And I've, below it, I've shown the magnitude spectrum. On this plot, I've put the zero frequency in the middle. Up here, I had the zero frequency on the left-hand side and it went up to 100 hertz. I'm just showing it in the middle here to highlight the fact that there are these two delta functions. As we said before, for a cos waveform in the time domain, you have two delta functions, one for the positive frequency, one for the negative. And as we said, this is one hertz, so it's one shifted to the right of zero and one shifted to the left. Now, what do we expect to see when we use this impulse train at the top to sample this digital signal of the cos wave? We're going to do that by multiplying these two together. So in the time domain, we're going to multiply the top graph with the third graph. Of course, if we multiply in the time domain, it means we are convolving in the frequency domain. So we are going to expect to see the convolution of the second graph with the fourth graph. And when we convolve, a function with a delta function, then that function gets located over each of the delta functions. So we're going to expect to see two delta functions here, two delta functions here, two here, and two here. So now I'm showing these sampled function uh, up the top. The top two are the same. It's our impulse train that we're using for sampling and it's Fourier transform. Here's the signal. And now I'm showing the sampled signal. This is the result of multiplying the top function with the third function. And what happens in the frequency domain? Well, it's what we expected. We now see the cos two delta functions from the cos function appearing at each of the locations of our Fourier transform of our impulse train. So around 20, around 40, 60, and 80. Now, Let's think about what this means in terms of the frequencies that we are able to sample and then recover. So importantly, this 20 sample here is now our sampling rate. So the, according to Nyquist's theorem, the maximum frequency that we can uh, accurately record with that frequency of sampling is going to be half. So here is our Nyquist frequency. That will be the largest frequency in the signal that we are able to sample when we are sampling at 20 hertz. So let's see how that comes about and let's try to understand that. So we're going to be looking at this frequency 10 and trying to see how that relates to this signal that we are sampling. So here we've got the 1 hertz cos wave. I'm now going to replace it with a 2 hertz cos wave. So a cos wave that now changes twice over this period. And what we can see is that again, we've got the sampled waveform here, and we can see now that our two delta functions are further apart. They are now two samples in the frequency domain, each side of 20 and 40 and 60 and 80. And that's because our frequency now is two hertz of our cos waveform. So as we keep increasing the frequency, these two delta functions will be moving further and further apart. And as I do that, you can watch the effect of the moving apart and you can see the effect on the sampled waveform here. So they're moved apart. Now we have more cycles. They're moving further apart. And here, interestingly, they are equally spaced. As we keep increasing the frequency of the waveform that we're sampling, our Functions move further apart still, away from 20 and 40, and they start looking more like they're two that are centered around 10. And as we go one more, uh, again, even higher frequency, and then we go to the maximum frequency that we can do, which is 10 hertz. And here's the sine wave, which corresponds to the Nyquist frequency. This is the highest frequency that we can sample at the sampling rate that we have and then be able to fully reconstruct the signal. 
And let's look at what that has in the time domain. Uh, in the time domain now, our sample is going from positive to negative to positive to negative. There is no faster change in a signal that we are able to record with these samples. When the samples are going from fully positive to fully negative, fully positive, fully negative, that is the fastest that those samples can go. And in the frequency domain, we can see that we've now had those two delta functions are appearing at the same frequency, so at 10 hertz exactly. So hopefully this has given you more insights into sampling with an impulse train, in particular digital signal sampling, and looking at it in the time domain and the frequency domain to understand why it is that there's this Nyquist frequency that we cannot go beyond uh, in terms of being able to represent the signal from our samples. If it has uh, given you more insights, please give the video a like. It helps others to find the video. Of course, subscribe to the channel for more videos. And you can check out the description below. You'll find a web page with a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel, including PDF summary sheets that you can download, which includes the MATLAB code that I've used for making this video.